when I went to pivot, 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 I, it just, I heard like a pop oh. but in my body pop. Like wow. I could feel it. Like I could, I felt it. Like I could feel it in my knee, not pain, just like an explosion. Okay, now we're doing. I got two thirds of God TV here. Mickey James, SoCal Val. How are you guys? Very well. Thank you. Doing great. Yeah. We are all in like completely different parts of the world here, but through technology, we're able to come together. I know. This is amazing. Yeah. And I Val, you're in Val's in the UK, right? Yes, yeah, SoCal Val, who's only lived in SoCal a couple of years calls Orlando, Florida home is in England. You gotta keep up, really. I just make no sense, my name, my name makes no sense at all. Well, everyone just must assume you you live in SoCal because it's in your name. You know, they're mm, saying yeah. it all the time. Yeah, most people don't even know what SoCal is, which is even funnier. I've been announced as like SoCalvia, like people don't, especially over here, it's not a thing to say the word SoCal. So that usually it's Social Val. I have a mug that Simon gave me that says Social Val. Social Val, <laughs> and Nick, you're in, it's very you're in uh, Tennessee, right? I am, I'm in Nashville right now. Very nice. And Nashville is like opening up quite a bit, I believe. Um, they have been. That doesn't mean I've not been as much. I've gone to, you know, I go to the gym, but you have to, wear, you know, wear the mask and stuff in the gym. But um, Virginia, I'm still back in Virginia and Nashville. So it's like, it's, it's funny because one week I'll be in Virginia and everything's still like, I think they just started to reopen. I think the gym's just opened today in wow. Richmond, which the gyms here in Nashville had opened a couple of weeks ago, but you had to wear the masks and everything in. But I think last week they actually opened to where it's just suggested that you wear the mask. Oh, wow. Well, they, you're I extra know. cautious being a mom, right? For sure. For sure. Well, not, and not just being a mom. I was like, I said this on a Instagram live I did the other day. It's more about, you know, my mom who gets like asthma and bronchitis certain times of the year and she's just got allergies and stuff. And then my grandma, who also, you know, she smoked forever and she's 77 years old and she's feeble. And so if she was to catch this thing, it would be the end of her in that sense. You know, I really, I would, I hate to say that, but like, that's because that's what this virus really like jumps on. And that's who's been the most affected on that side. But so that's why I wear the mask the most, you know, I think right. me, Nick, Donovan, we'd all be okay. I don't want us to catch it because it's terrible, but we'd be all right. Whereas other people who we would come in contact with would not be so fortunate, perhaps. So mm. I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. No well, I gotta, or God. Uh, or God. <laughs> I got to say, this is the first time I've had two guests on this streaming platform here. I'm so glad it's working here. You guys do this all the time, though. And uh, for people who don't know what God TV is, it's you two and Lisa Marie basically talking about whatever it is that you guys want to talk about. That's right. I have to give Mickey the credit for the name because we just thought it was so all encompassing of like what we're trying to kind of portray, you know, grown ass women. Uh, we're in different kind of phases of our lives. We're going through different, you know, career things and relationship things. And uh, but what we're trying to do is be grown ass women in every sense of the word. And it's funny because it's it's a show with people from wrestling and we sometimes have wrestling guests on, but it's really not a show about wrestling. It's about, you know, it's a lot more personal than just the interviews that you get a lot of times, how'd you get started in wrestling and things like that. It's a lot more about our current lives now, what we want to do, um, you know, with our lives. We have a lot of female fans that tune in because obviously wrestling is a very male dominated industry, which is fine, but it's kind of a place where you can come and have a slumber party with us, have a glass of wine or five. We're not here to judge. And <laughs> we talk about life and love and and we play silly games. We try to keep it very lighthearted. I have to say that we've had some more serious conversations before, and we really think it's cool that the fans like when we sort of open up and we get a little serious. But for the most part, we've been sort of called an escapism for what's going on right now, and we keep it light and fun. So I think it's it's good timing to have something like this to watch every Wednesday night at 5 p.m. Eastern. <laughs> Bam! 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 Was this ever part of the plan, or did quarantine happen, and you three went, you know what? Now's the time to do this. Um, I would say it's a, been a little bit of both. You know, Val's very, like, she's always done shows. She did Pillow Talk when we were in TNA, which is very similar to this show, right? Like, that was so fun. But yeah. we separately have always talked about, like, doing some type of, like, female-inspired, empowering type of show. But we've never found the time. Or, like, I went back to WWE full-time, and then everything's just kind of been... We're like, oh, maybe one day, or we just joke about it, and we still like would just be on our boxers laughing at each other, mm -hmm. you know. And Lisa, I think, 
equally as she's like at such a different phase because she retired from the ring last year. So she's mm -hmm. in that transitional phase of like, okay, this has been my life for X amount of years. And like, what is this next step? And if you don't know Lisa, she's literally one of the funniest people. Oh on my the God. Yeah. She's yeah. so funny. It's like, to give you an example, the first episode, she, with unbeknownst to us at all, shows up in a dinosaur onesie. Don't know why. <laughs> don't know why. She just decided to be Dinomania running wild. And she's so random and funny. And honestly, our boxes together were so funny anyway that it's just like, that's exactly what you're getting is us, us off the cuff. And I always sort of describe it like if there was a signing or a, or a show that you went to, you would find Mickey, Lisa, and myself in our pajamas, drinking wine in our, in our hotel room cracking up and telling stories about exes and hilarious, horrible jobs we've had and whatever. And it's sort of like your, your way to hang out with us virtually. And there's, it's unfiltered. We should warn you about that. A lot yeah. of, uh, <laughs> a lot of That's shots. What's great had. about it though. Yeah. Yeah. Is it too early to pour a quarantini or to have a glass of wine here? It's never too early. I wish you would have told me. I mean, I'm drinking. Uh, it, it is. It is. It's not even noon yet. Well, here. <laughs> it was like ten without wine. Yeah. Uh, All right, well, I'll, I'll, we'll have one after, and then when people you know, watch, we're gonna have to talk to Alan more. about Alan's arm bar. You know, our special gall mixologist. Mm -hmm. that special quarantinis and and all kinds of drinks for our guests and for our yeah. sponsors. He's personalizing a special uh, concoction for ODB, who just debuted on the show last week. We sort of left everyone on a cliffhanger, and this week she's doing a full episode for us. So she's going to have her own special drink, uh, courtesy of Ga TV's mixologist, Alan Ayers, who's also my husband, who also uh, we've recruited into being our mixologist and creating a whole show from behind the bar. Because, again, let's be honest, when we're winding down after a long day, we like to do the show having a cocktail or, or two or five. Or a couple. Yeah. Well, this might be work for cheap, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> so while this might be a product of the time that we're living in right now, product of quarantine, this is something you guys plan to do for you know a long time, even after this situation's over. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep doing it because it's so fun. And I think it's a way to, we tell wrestling stories too. Like we've gone back and told some like from the road or from the locker room or like this time. So it's kind of funny, especially when we bring on our guests and we have some cool guests lined up. So, um, and what I love about it is that it's not just wrestling guests, you know, it, it's people from all kind of wa walks of the earth. Like we had um, Mel from beyond the veil, who she's a, a ghost hunter and an astrologer and psychic medium. And so she was telling us all these ghost stories and her and her wife go out and do all this like ghost hunting stuff. And she showed us the ghost clip. It freaked us out. Oh my God. I had to edit the thing. I, I still can't even talk about it. It was, it was yeah. It was crazy. Chris, you could come on. You could be a grown ass yeah. man on our show. You, you have men on the show? We will have men on the show. No, seriously, you should come on. Cause you I mean, obviously we, we'd have a ball. We'll get you a few quarantines might make a personalized cocktail for you, Chris, but we did want to sort of establish the show with just us on it for the first few episodes. Okay. This yeah. is what you can expect. Um, not every time we'll have a guest, but we slowly started to integrate some of our female friends, like Mickey said, even ones that are not involved in wrestling. And we were so pleased um, at the response to Mel, for example, because not everyone could be into paranormal or, or ghost hunting or astrology, but a lot of our fans and friends are. So she was a great guest to have on. Now we're slowly integrating more females because, you know, we do talk a lot about female empowerment and what it means to be a grown ass woman, but we certainly will have guys on the show. We have a laundry list of hilarious guys. I mean, just to rattle off some names, Jay Lethal, Chavo Guerrero, Christopher Daniels, Maybe Nick Aldis. I'm not sure we can afford him, but we Nick can. Nick Aldis. He's pretty expensive, I know. I mean, we did promise him 0.0001%, but I yeah. think that we gave that to one of our, that, or a portion of that 1% to one of the fans, Frank, I believe his cat, or somebody's yeah. cat. Mm -hmm. um, Frank's cat. To be, or was it, you know, I don't know. Or was it a dog? I don't know. To be Bosley. Because it was someone more qualified. Let's put that. <laughs> What but, podcast do you guys listen to that maybe, you know, would have inspired uh, grown ass women? I have listened to a few, sorry to answer first, Mickey. No, go ahead. Um, That's the thing about that, this. I don't know how, I don't know. Should I direct my question? No, you guys no. We deal with it every single week. Cause we're like, we, we get so excited and we have so much to say that we're like, Oh, sorry, girl. Um, <laughs> yeah. We, uh, we, uh, some of us talked about liking podcasts or not being that into it before, but the ones I have listened to are mostly from Real Housewives and RuPaul's Drag Race. So I love the, both of those shows, and it's sort of women that I kind of uh, think a lot of. I mean, you can 
laugh about Real Housewives all you want, but a lot of these women are self-made and are have thriving businesses and are really, really smart ladies. Some of them just like eating bonbons and throwing lavish birthday parties, which is fine, we don't judge. But the ones that I like, you know, like Heather Dubrow and Ramona Singer and Sonia Morgan and some of these ones that have, um, you know, made quite a name for themselves. And I find it inspiring to listen to them. So that's a few of the things I was listening to before Gaw TV was a thing. Yeah. Whereas I'm very much the opposite. I don't listen to a lot of podcasts. I always watch like a lot of these shows. Like I'm more of like a YouTube show watcher than mm -hmm. I am a podcast listener. So I think that's where we could, because we haven't launched the um, Gaw podcast yeah we thought about doing this and then we thought oh well, we'll just pull the audio from our edits and then we can yeah. turn it into a podcast and what we realize is that it's very our show right now is very visual friendly it's very made it's made for youtube it's made for a visual kind of product whereas mm -hmm. like we're going to start looking into perhaps developing something that is more podcast friendly so that way it's two different platforms and you kind of get the same show but you get a little bit of a different kind of show yeah mm -hmm. it's it's it is really different it's real different well, the possibilities are endless here. I started mine as a YouTube channel and then eventually transitioned over to a podcast and it's possible and people are going to consume this one way or another. So right. I think that the more you can put out there, the better. For yeah. sure. That's so for, for all three of you, you, you are now grown ass women compared to where you were when you debuted. So I will start with you, Mickey. What's the biggest thing that you've learned from your debut to where you're at right now? Um. Wow. Uh, more, I think to, um, be more kind to myself, I think be more kind to myself and be more forgiving of myself. I think we're so, especially in this industry, like we are our hardest critics. Like we can, in my eyes, nothing is ever perfect. Even when someone's gone and they're like, that was such an incredible match. In my mind, I'm thinking like, oh, what was this, this thing I could have done better or that or I was like, oh, why did I do that there? Or even in my promos and everything, we, I am a nitpicker. I pick everything apart. So I've learned to be more kind and to take, um, take like people, when people put you over like that, to be able to take it and just say thank you without mm -hmm. being like, oh yeah, you think so? Oh, thanks. Like that like assuredness in yourself or like that confidence that like when someone's giving you a compliment that it's a genuine compliment and it's not, you know what I mean? Yeah. No, we didn't do that to ourselves. We had this conversation. It might have been episode one or no, episode two, because we watched ourselves back and we were like, oh my God, I couldn't stand how I said this word over and over. And I kept touching my hair and blah, blah. And we're like, you know, we're supposed to be these confident, grown ass women. And we're sitting here nitpicking ourselves all the time. It's ridiculous. I am so guilty of that too. I can't just take a compliment. I have to go, oh, well, girl, it was only, you know, two pounds or, oh, well, you know, I, I got it on on sale. Now, you do these things all the time and you have to, as you get older, remind yourself to just say thank you and to believe someone when they think that you've done a good job, even if you're going to nitpick yourself. So that goes into what I was going to say. I think I was too much of a people pleaser, still sometimes am. Um, I say yes to everything. <laughs> that sounds a little terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Not everything, <laughs> but hey, Ben's was asking. I say yes to everything. I get too many projects thrown at me, and then I sort of overwhelm myself. Plus, I think being a people pleaser just means like I would just care what too much people think, and I, you know, would was always af afraid to offend somebody if I couldn't make an invite, things like that. It sounds like small things, but um, just a couple years ago, my girlfriend and I made a a pact to sort of stop being a people pleaser and to write down how we were doing, and it really helped. And nowadays, I'm a horrible person. <laughs> 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 now I only please myself. <laughs> I'm so grateful for quarantine. I don't even have to make excuses as to why I don't see anybody. I don't have to hug anybody. It's amazing. <laughs> is true. So is this is this also the type of advice you would give to someone that's maybe coming up? Not not just in the wrestling industry, but someone who's trying to figure out their career. Someone who's trying to figure out who they are as a person. Is this the same you know type of advice that you would give to them? Um. Yes, but also to learn how to take corrective criticism to be able wow. to learn how to, because I think that that is, you know, even before, like I would always, if someone gave me corrective criticism, like I was kind of instilled in me in the wrestling business very early. And I think I took that from when I was training horses and when I was working with horses as a, um, you know, as a early adolescent, because I was constantly being criticized as to why, like fix your seat, like all, all that stuff for the show ring. Um, so I was already having that and that most athletes, so I think we come over and like we've played some sort of sports, but there's a lot of people that haven't. And so then to be able to take that criticism and, and realize that like your coach or your trainer or whoever is not trying to be, you know, or the person that you're asking for advice. I find that like if people ask you 
for advice and then you yeah. give them the advice, you can tell halfway through the advice that they've stopped listening to you because you haven't told them what they wanted to hear. You yeah. know what I mean? Like that old, like they just wanted to, for you to tell them that it was great. And nine times out of 10, it wasn't great, yeah. you know, like, and it's not like that. Like, that's just me. I'm like, if you ask me my opinion, I'm going to give you my honest opinion. And it's not like, I'm not only doing it because you asked me, you know what I mean? If you want me to tell you it's great, I can totally tell you it's great. But I think that that would be doing you a disservice when you're asking me for my advice. And I think that was a hard thing to learn when my first early years of like trying to do something and, and trying to make it great. Cause I would take that and be like, Oh, they hate me. Why? Why did I like, I would, beat myself up about it. Yeah, but it's real. And honestly, that's funny you say that, Mickey, because that's how I describe, not to like kiss your ass over here, but hey, um, <laughs> when I describe you to people that don't know you, especially here in England, I'll say, you would love Mickey. And the next thing I always say, oh my God, I want to get emotional. The next thing I always say is that she's going to tell you exactly how it is. And she's so real with you. And it's so effing refreshing because I'm so sick of these sort of surface friends who are like, oh my God, I like no, she's going to tell you to you straight. You're such a hard worker and I admire that about you, but um, <laughs> there's no but, I didn't mean like, but, but anyway, but, 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 um, yeah, no, I think what you said is true also, but people beating themselves up for, for silly things. And I find that with girls that want to say be influencers or bloggers, and I kind of deal with that sort of side of things more than wrestling nowadays. Here's an example. I was at a blogger event and I just said, oh, I'm going to make a video for us. So I said, hey guys, you know, it's Val, blah, 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 as I always do in my one little selfie area. My one angle that's good. I always say, like, see, I just did it. See, I just made fun of myself. And you did that. that. I just what you preach, Val. But I was <laughs> myself. And they were like, oh my God, you're just so comfortable doing that. You're so good at it. And I literally was just confused. And I said, but I wasn't always like that. I said, I, I had to learn. I had to force myself to be on camera. Chris, you'll know, you know, with the with the presenting and the acting side, Mickey, of course, knows. You have to watch yourself back and critique yourself in a healthy way. And you just have to put yourself out there. Stop beating yourself up. Oh, I could never do that. I could never be on camera. You need to try it and then, you know, see what you're good at, period. And just try everything. Yeah, I, I'm a firm believer that anyone can do anything. It's just okay. a matter of are you able to get past that first speed bump of going, can I do this thing? Mm -hmm. And for someone that wants to be on camera, you just have to get used to being able to see yourself. Right. On camera and going, yeah, you do that weird thing with your eyes or your mouth makes that weird thing when you talk. Yes, that is you. And that's how that's everyone you. sees you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's horrible. I told someone the other day about, oh, they said they hated their voice on a voicemail. And I said, I think I was, it was Wembley Stadium I walked into and they were playing a commercial that was like my voiceover. And I was like, oh dear God, it was the most horrible feeling. And this is like years and years in, but it's still, we still hate ourselves how we sound. It's horrible. Val, how what is it that you're doing now? So um, obviously we have Ga TV. I do um, a lot of stuff fashion related here in, in, I would say in London, I'm in Milton Keynes, half hour north, but it's horrible in a way because um, before lockdown, I was just starting to get to do uh, some more presenting for like London Fashion Week. I was invited to London Fashion Week men's and I was slowly kind of getting into that, um, that vibe a little bit more. And I've done a lot of my own stuff, but this was actually companies and brands were coming to me more. Um, it hasn't totally slowed down, but obviously being a presenter with events and wanting to go interview people, that part of it I, I do miss. And aside from that, I was doing a lot of comic cons. I'd say I'd had like two or three a month. Weekends I'd be away for Showmasters, um, Monopoly events. And I, you know, I went to Pakistan, did some re-announcing. I sort of, again, just kind of say yes to everything in terms of an opportunity. So I still do wrestling events here and there, but the comic cons, I do the celebrity Q and A's, interviews and stuff like that. That's what I think, that's where I think my skills are the best. I love the modeling, I love the Patreon, stuff like that. But to me, I would be re really dissatisfied doing only that. So it's, it's really the presenting that I like more than anything. And Mickey, we haven't seen you in a while. So I wanna ask you, no. first of all, how is your knee doing? It's so good. It's actually really good. My knee's doing much better. Because it was um, about a year ago you had the surgery. I did. I was going to try to show you my ugly scar. Uh, oh, that, that doesn't look so it? bad. It's not terrible. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> well, we're getting exclusive here. <laughs> look at this balance here, here ladies and black guy. Ew! And then it's got the little butterflies from where they went in and like they had to... Yeah. It's great. <laughs> no, it's fine. Aside from that hideous scar. I know. I never showed you my scar before, Val. No. Did you? I know you know, content for you, Chris. Just get those extra. We're going to get five more clicks off that. I can't wait. Wow. That, that can be the <laughs> thumbnail. Your knee. Your, your knee. Just right there in the center. <laughs> I need you to put that in there. <laughs> ah. <laughs> did you totally instantly like know that something was wrong? Yes. Instantly. Um. It was so crazy because I was just a regular match. It was a simple hold. It was like, 
I was the heel, you know what I mean? I'm like, I got um, Carmella. I was, uh, you know, in a, I think, I don't know, some type of cravat or something. Cause we had been, it was literally like the last, we probably had like two more minutes left in this match. Like, honestly, like it was that level, like getting ready to go home, I think. And she rolled me off from the hold. And there was like, I just, when I went to pivot, pivot, pivot. I, it just, I heard like a pop oh. but in my body pop. Like no. I could feel it. Like I could, I felt it. Like I could feel it in my knee, not pain, just like an explosion, but it was literally a, a, a pop that I felt and heard in my head. It was crazy. And I was like, that was weird. I went to go stand up and I kind of buckled, you know, and then I went, oh. to, I was like, whoa. And, and the referee is there. Um, who was the ref? Was it spider? Who was the ref? I, I, I knew I was super hot at him about, cause he stopped the match and I was so, so how dare he? that he stopped. How dare you? He did the right thing. He did the right thing. Cause that's just me and my ego. I wanted to finish the match. I figured, okay, I, I could get through this. I know how tough I am. And so I, the first time I went to go, so I went to go stand up again and it was just a little bit wobbly and he just rung the bell and I'm like, no, <laughs> I just said you're a hard worker. That's taking it to a whole nother degree. Yeah. I was so pissed, rolled out of the ring with my hands. They were like, God, I was fine. <laughs> and paced myself. I walked myself back to the mat. Well, with a little limpy, but all the way back to the curtain because I was so devastated, so PO'd. Oh. But yeah, then come to find out, they thought I tore my meniscus at first. I've had the doc look at it. He goes, this hurt? No. This hurt? No. Did it hurt when you did it? Not really. What did it sound like? I'm like, a pop. Like a pop. And he's like, ooh. So. Oh. <laughs> You're used to hearing yeah. pop in your match, but that's not the pop you want to hear. Know what I'm saying? I live for the pop, but not that pop. No. <laughs> So how how soon after that did you have surgery? Mm, that was the catchy thing. So um, so then I had to fly to Nashville because I was going in the studio and going to do stuff that next week. So they just flew me in early, and I had the um, you know the MRI done or whatever it was done on the knee. And then not even until I got back out into the car did the doc have the news back. So he told me like with the M with um like a torn meniscus, I'd probably be like six to eight weeks. What well, eight to six to nine weeks maybe out. And I was like, oh, that kind of sucks. But at that time I'd already been transferred over to SmackDown. I hadn't debuted on TV on SmackDown after WrestleMania, you know? So I was just kind of sitting and waiting. And that was actually my first loop of house shows, which was the ironic thing, you know, oh maybe it wasn't meant to be me in SmackDown. Anyway. <laughs> it's a rock show. It's crazy. Yeah. So, but then I like, so I did it and then, I got to the car and he's like, Oh, are you sitting down? I'm like, well, yeah, kind of in my car, you know, he's like, so it's, you know, it's not your meniscus. It's your whole ACL. And I'm like, I'm thinking like, how is that even possible? Cause I'm up walking around. I think yeah. football players go down from an ACL thing and I see them buckle and like they're wincing in pain. Mine wasn't painful. It wasn't any of those things. So <laughs> it was a little, I'm so tough. <laughs> Like I'm walking around with wheels and like, you know, clip clop, clip clop. More like a clip clop. <laughs> so is this then a blessing in disguise because you get to be home with Donovan all the time? Yes, it was a blessing because honestly, it was, you know, being back on the road, it was I was a lot away a lot. And yeah. next year, this is the year that Donovan goes to school. He starts school this year full time. Um, well, I don't know how that's gonna work out with all this, you know, corona, but it was my last year really to be as much at home with him as possible until that starts. So that was kind of a blessing, but I had to wait like a month to get surgery because I had all this, I had the, I was opening for big and rich back home, like on the music side and stuff like that. And so I was like, I don't want to, I can't cancel this a month out. So I literally just like powered through it and then got the surgery right after it. Wow. And Val's right. So tough. Wow. I, T you, you, triple F tough. You were performing on stage with a torn ACL. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if they were um, happy with me about that, but it's okay. They seem to have forgiven me. <laughs> they had like nine months to do so. <laughs> wow. So you're yeah. good. You're you're ready to make. I am. Work. I'm good. I'm ready. I'm honestly just waiting. You know, I. It's you know, it's the process of getting cleared is is a whole thing. And unfortunately, my clearance time came right in the midst of this 
whole outbreak. And I was actually in Florida. I was at the performance center training, working with the, um, with Tara, with everybody down there, just kind of see where I was at. I'd already done all my therapy leading up. I'd seen the doc, the doc had already cleared me. So I was literally just trying getting that like last two weeks to get cleared, to come back to in ring action and all this stuff and everything got shut down. And so I got, you know, I went home and then I just haven't been back since. So, which is fine because it's like, you know, like I said, it's like everybody's kind of got different levels of like what's, what's handling. And I'm like, there's no need to take that risk of going there if I'm not doing anything. Right. So yeah. I would rather bide my time and wait for the perfect opportunity. Perhaps another blessing in disguise then. Perhaps, perhaps until I go in, I'm going to take all the championships. All of them. I'm going to be a single, I'm going to be my own tag team partner. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go in there and I'm going to take that, those championships first. And then I'm going to take both of the women's championships at the same time. So I can be, you know, beyond, I've, I've already been claimed myself the triple crown champ a long time ago. So I just don't know corn, Corn Queen, maybe, or something. Ooh. I like that. Well, it was Becky it was like so you would be, you'd be Mickey. Like four belts. <laughs> what? So it, Becky was Becky two belts when she had both belts. You'd be Mickey four belts. Right. So that's why I come with the core. core like yeah. Qua, some type of qua. Qua, qua didn't. Rolls right mm. off the tongue. The quadruple core. <laughs> <is really laughs> yeah, that's going to be so good. <laughs> now with all this with all this talk about wrestling was there ever was there ever a time when you thought you'd want to get in the ring no actually i'm allergic and it's i you know i hate that I heard it hurts a lot i bruise like a peach in all seriousness no i there was like when i was you know 11 watching it i kind of thought oh i might be a wrestler but i didn't uh you know we've had a conversation so many times i was a wwe divas fan and i loved the divas matches but i was like oh my god they're backstage in satin robes and they're fighting. Like, this is great. Like, I love the more <laughs> that side of things. I never, I, thought I, wanted, I wanted to do that. I wanted to like have the microphone and like be Stephanie McMahon, but I was not like, I wanted to be Lita and like come in there and like kick ass. I was like, oh God, no. Yeah. 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 More of a Miss Elizabeth of sorts. Yeah. 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 I didn't, I never mind, minded the idea of like playing the damsel in distress. And some people are like, oh, well, that's very like the opposite of progressive. And I'll be like, listen, I kind of liked it. There were, there were both. There were some girls that were, that's what feminism is, isn't it? It's about choice. Yeah. I choose to be kind of the more soap opera, soap opera actress. I mean, hello on impact wrestling. All I did was cry all the time, but I loved it. And then there were more serious wrestlers too, like the Gail Kim's and the Mickey's and Lisa's. I think it's cool to have all of those things uh, encompass wrestling. What, yeah. what you've done in your career, Val, is, is actually very rare. It's very rare to have someone who comes in and is a character on screen, but actually doesn't mix it up in the ring. Right. Yeah, and I always thought that was kind of more of my my thing. And I, I think the first girl I ever saw, other than even when I was watching wrestling, they had, you know, people like Maria and Terry and girls like that doing the interviews, but they were wrestlers. I mean, they were kind of more divas and wrestlers. They wrestled quite a bit, right. um, you know, um, but then there were the people like Stephanie and, and Trish, but see, even they wrestled quite a bit. But the first girl, one of the first girls I saw on TV that was like a more modern character or personality was Renee Young. And I remember I was actually watching a pay-per-view at someone's house. And I said, who's this girl? And they said, oh, she's, a, she's an announcer. I said, oh, well, she, I'm sure she trains and she's a, in training. And they said, no, no, no. She had a show in Canada and she was just an announcer. And I thought that was, I was like, you're kidding me. Cause I've always kind of wanted to see that, that this girl was so good at the interviews and stuff. And with all due respect to some of the wrestlers who did that side of it, she blew all them out of the water. She just knew what she was doing. She was very quick witted right. um, naturally, but, but not like in a, you know, it's hard to be, you can attest to this, Chris, you want to be a host that's professional and does your host hands and you're, you've got that announcer voice, but you also want to come across as likable and natural. And I always thought she was perfect at it. Yeah. Renee, Renee is very good. I actually, I was, I was hosting a TV show in Toronto while she was also hosting a TV show in Toronto okay. and our paths would cross a lot. And then a few years later, I'm like, she's on WWE now. Yeah. yeah. She's yeah. absolutely incredible. And I think that's the thing. I think we try to blur those lines too much of like, because you're in the world of wrestling that you have to be able to be a wrestler. But I, being a growing up a fan of wrestling and everything, I've always appreciated the different elements. I like it. The fact that not every girl was, you know, a five-star wrestler that way, if someone like a Val was to get into something, there's real jeopardy there when the yep. sense of like, because you know, she's not a perfect, she's not in ring trained and stuff. And mm -hmm. when you speak on Renee, Renee is incredible. She is my favorite. Yeah. 
I and she's a lovely person girl, too. You yeah. have to have that personality like you have, like she has, like for the backstage interviewers and stuff that are quick witted, that are smart, that can think on their feet and like organically pull those um, reactions and emotions out of people and, and lead a conversation like you guys do. Like, you know, me, I just babble. That's what I do. That's why you're great. We should have that's a show. That's what I mean, that's how we do. But no, it's also the thing I respect. Like Renee is so great, and and the ones that I that I looked up to and thought were great and still do. It's like the interview. I've worked with so many people that the interviews, um, they, they make it about themselves. Or I don't know if they're they're trying to be in the business in a different way or what. But it's like you're there as the interview. You have to be very respectful. If someone's trying to be intimidating, you need to look intimidated. It's one of those things too. So I think right. she kind of gets it in every sense of the word. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned uh, about the the divas wearing the satin rose backstage, and that was, you know, when you started watching Val. But think of how different wrestling is now. Yeah. And uh, sp especially for you, Mickey, you know, with the incredible career that you've had, what's the biggest change that you think you've seen since you debuted? Um, I think that it's, you know, I think the way that women's wrestling is perceived on every level. You know what I mean? It really took the fans changing their perception of like what they wanted to see from women for the company to follow suit. Because as long as the fans were loving the content of like me personally, like I know people kind of go back and forth and I, you know, I've, I think I've openly said like, Oh, I wasn't the biggest fan of like the term diva or the divas belt only not for any other reason. Like I saw the marketing. I thought it was empowering for girls. I thought all that stuff more on a selfish level. I didn't like the term because then I felt like, well, I want to be Mickey James, the superstar. I don't want to be one of the divas. I felt like it clumped me into a group where mm -hmm. then it was harder to break out and define myself. And it was like me wanting to be a superstar. I wanted to be a household name. I wanted to be the name on the marquee. Like in that sense, I didn't want to be, oh, and the divas. Like, yeah, it was and great. Also too, like oh, one of us jacked up and messed up really bad. It's not going to look when they put the headlines out, oh, that person, because we're not being branded like as much like we're a Trish and Lita and, and Miss Elizabeth, they were all, they had their names, you know what I mean? It would have been, oh, one of the divas. And I was like, wait a minute here. You know what I mean? If I'm gonna make a bad decision, I'll make my own bad decisions or if somebody else wants to, but I don't want the whole, everybody to pay for my bad decision. You know You're gonna remember my name. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna know my name. <laughs> Deep is an interesting term because it kind of has a bit of a negative connotation. It's a bit, yeah, it's kind of, um, it was empowering. I think it's like just the way you spin it or whatever. But when you look at the reality of what the context of the word is, it's, it is a bit of a, you know, a backhanded kind of. Yeah. Especially when the opposite is superstar. So you've got the superstar and then a diva. When someone's acting like a diva, yeah. well, that's not a superstar at all. Right. It's annoying. It's like, oh, you don't want to be a diva, actually. It's kind of like, wait, what a minute? Wait a minute. Yeah, I think it's like Mariah Carey demanding like 40,000 white roses in her dressing room as a diva. And of course, I watched it so long that like, I don't think of the WWE divas in that sense at all. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you don't know, for example, when I, when I was starting to work for TNA Wrestling, it was real fun to tell people in airports I work for a company called TNA. That yeah. was them. So they started to you got to change and roll with the punches. They're like, I'm right. sure you know. Yeah, That's so they immediately fun. assumed, right? Like TNA. Because even when I first came over, it wasn't Impact. It transitioned when they switched over to Spike to Impact. But so they have to say like, oh, yeah, I work for TNA. They're like, oh, what's that? I'm the like, in the airport no. never asked. Yeah, they were, oh, TNA Wrestling. They'd go, oh, well, that sounds cool. But where are they? What do you wear? <laughs> Would you ever say like I work for total nonstop action wrestling? <laughs> Just rolls right off the tongue. As well. yeah, 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 yeah. Impact was very welcome in that, and I still refer to it as TNA just because it's old school. But like, I Impact Wrestling was a much more fitting, non-controversial name. But you're right; yeah. most people still call it TNA because it was TNA for so long. Yeah, I know. I know. It's crazy. But to say that, you know, but I also enjoyed those different like Val's talking about like. People can say whatever they want, but I'll be honest, like sometimes those like silly segments of the water gun, the water fight gimmick, <laughs> like we were out there and we were shooting each other in the face. It was so for me, like people, oh, it's demoralizing and everything. Okay, so look, I know what I signed up for when I got into wrestling, and I was confident in myself enough to be okay being put in those situations. And like I made sure I worked out so I felt good in those situations or whatever the case may be. But 
in those moments of like, I'm thinking like, okay, it takes time. It takes time to break down all these barriers, right? Nothing ever happens overnight. So if I, as a performer, can change people's perception of what they expect from a woman's wrestler, like, mm -hmm. it's, and then over time, then hopefully this, the whole perception will change. But if this is my opportunity to have 10 minutes on television, shooting one of my friends in the face with a water gun, I'm absolutely going to do it. And I'm going to pump it as hard as I can. We are going to uh, have to introduce uh, um, maybe an annual GAW TV water gun -a mania paper. Mm. Now that I'd be interested in. No, in all seriousness, she's not kidding. Like, I mean, this is why feminism is about choice and because she enjoyed doing those segments. If we were to meet a girl that came on the show that said, I was in those segments with you and they made me feel very demoralized, that's her choice. But all we can speak for is ourselves and what we enjoy doing and watching. And in my case, aspiring to be. I loved those photo shoots y'all did. Like the... Oh. They were so fun. Yeah. They don't do those anymore. Do you know that they would fly us to these locations? Like, I'm like, oh, those were my favorite things doing the photo shoots. Are you yeah. kidding? Yes, they please do. take me to an island where I can just like be bougie and hang out and order room service and go take, go get my mayor, my makeup, makeup, go get my makeup and my hair done and go out on the beach and look like a, a princess as you guys are like taking my picture and then going to yeah. airbrush them and make me look even more amazing. Thank you. And you're with your friends. It's, it's yeah, not with my friends. And I get a whole week there to hang out and just do me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Nikki and Lisa and I have talked about it and we are not kidding around. As soon as lockdown's over, we want to plan some sort of a, li a live GAW TV trip that might include, you know, maybe not bikini photo shoots, depending on how we feel, but, you know, maybe a themed somewhere. We've talked about going to Vegas, recording some stuff on the road, doing meet and greets with the fans and sort of bringing it back to, again, a lighthearted sort of fun place where we're allowed to be glam and silly and then you know you know at least it's going to bust out some sort of kitty cat onesie or something at night with everybody on stage you know it so this is the kind of fluff <laughs> pun intended a lot more fluff that we sort of think wrestling could use a little bit more of why not well there's been another shift over the last few weeks i think uh with what's going on with women in wrestling with this whole speaking out movement what's what's your take on everything that's been going on with that um, I just answered this question uh, a couple uh, days ago on an interview, so I'll use the same answer. No, I am. Um, so I have to say, you know, our show being so female oriented and, and we're always saying we're girls, girls, obviously the first thing I would say about it is we're so proud of these brave uh, women and some men that have come forward and, and talked about what they've been through. There's always going to be a few bad apples where it's, whether it's a, you know, someone not understanding the movement or not supporting the movement. Um, but it's, it's the same thing with any sort of movement that makes uh, a lot of people feel better about coming out with their story. You have to respect that and you have to um, show solidarity with the people that, are, that have been through a lot of stuff. Um, I don't know anyone who in their right mind would ever think that this movement wasn't a good thing. All I can say is that I hope that it not only exposes a lot of the abusers, but that it makes the female um, side of wrestling kind of band together so it doesn't happen to anyone else ever again. That's that's the, That's the gotta be the end goal here. So what we've been trying to do is figure out a way to um, make it accessible for, for anyone, men or women, um, that are have been in these situations to get help, to get legal representation, things like that. Kelly Klein, I just saw posted the other day, um, some numbers and information and hotlines for people to reach out to. So if you were one of the ones that, thank goodness, I have not been involved in anything like that, all I can do is stand back and support everybody and try to make sure that there's resources to make sure it never happens again. Yeah, it's it's tough. It's so hard and it's so ugly and, and my heart bleeds for everyone. You know, I am I am already an advocate for child help, for child abuse. And I've gone to Capitol Hill to like try to change some of these laws just on that side of it. So it's really awful to see. And I think I've been very blessed because I surrounded myself with some really amazing people and I was protected. I, when I say, oh, were my trainers hard on me? Yes, because I wanted them to be hard on me because I want it to be the best. This business isn't for everybody on that aspect, but we're talking about, you know, sexual assault and stuff like that is something that really just... It, it really hits me hard because it just, there's so many things that, um, that even judicially are like so jacked up about it as far as all that stuff. So <clears throat> I just pray that like everyone who is like all these people who are real, real predators, real assailants. And I'm not talking about like trainers who are too hard on you or whatever, like that, that's neither here or there, but I'm like that, like, or if it's been rape or anything like that, like, we need to weed people like that out because 
this, you know, the thing is, is like, I feel like this is perhaps something, I mean, if people knew what went on in Japan, you know, with like young boys and stuff, I think that that it would be astounding. Like it's, you know, that's, and that's culturally bred in the wrestling business in the fabrics of the culture. You know what I mean? This business, if you go back to the test, like the way back, it's like, it was a circus act. It was like, literally we, they went town to town as a circus in these territories. And so at that time, I think a lot more, you know, if, if we were to be real, you know, really think about it, there's probably been a fair, like a lot of men, a lot more men who would never come forward because it would deplete their masculinity in a mm -hmm. sense that would come forward in some of these same similar situations. And, uh, but cult, like, so culturally, like, there is that. And then you look and there was not a lot of females in the business. And so it's come to this involvement of having so many females now in within the business that have separately or together and maybe in the same kind of environment experienced some of these things and them having that strength to be able to say, hey, this is bullshit. This is happening. And this shouldn't be like this shouldn't be happening. And it's I'm so grateful for those that have had, you know, found that power within them to stand up and say, this, I'm not going to stand for this anymore because it's a powerful thing. And I think, you know, we have movements like this all the time. And it, it really does take that unity and people, you know, the last thing you want is like people not to believe your story or anything like that. But, you know, I think there's a lot of parallels, too, because people then go like, some people are going like, there's no way all these things are true. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or there's some, like when Val says, it's like, okay, so when I think about this and this maybe because this is the part that personally like affects me is the sexual part. So that when I hear, Oh, my trainer was too hard on me speaking out. I'm going, it's not the same. Yeah. It's not the same. It's thing. not. That's, That's the same, no. Don't it's, model. I'm like, Please don't don't use this platform to do like I get that and that sucks that if you think your trainer's too hard on you then maybe transfer your schools or whatever the case may be but that's not the same as throwing them in with you know in this aspect that then their name is tarnished because not everybody's going to do the research right to no. find out okay well what are they accusing that person of or whatever the case may be nobody's going to do the research to find out what's the real like story on both ends and, and we live in a society that is so quick to like just jump on the internet and just hurl all not just accusations but hurl then um just like these insults and just completely destroy somebody without doing any real journalism without doing any real reporting and basing your opinion you know as facts and like reporting your opinion as facts mm -hmm. and it's so like so it can be completely damaging if it turns out to be untrue which you yeah. know i never want to say that anybody's ever like but you have to think like in a real sense and then the damage that that does is for someone who's gone to capitol hill to do, do all this like it waters down the message to where people stop taking it seriously or they think oh they're just being a bunch of wimps or whatever and it's like no 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 this is different it's like that this is a real thing you know what i mean and so you have to be cognizant of what you're putting out there and what you're doing and the fact that people's by the time people if someone is proven innocent if they are when they're proven guilty you know what f them they needed to go along go. see you bye but if they are proven innocent at that point no one's even listening like right. so, so the they have made up their mind and they're guilty forever in their mind of whatever they have and that's like a weird because we live in such a fast moving media fake news sometimes society that it's like you read what you want to read you believe what you want to believe and then that's it and then and that's that's you know and so I think this we have to be conscious and we have to be smart. And that's why we want to team with like rain and we want to work with, you know, I, I already work with child help and, you know, unfortunately like all these, most of these people have graduated out of the services of child help, but that's cause that's more geared towards children. And so, you know, it's just crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, and, it is. and I think that's the biggest thing that, that's bothered us is like, you know, like she said, for every hundred 200 stories that are that are real there might be one that's completely not in the same line of what the movement's about and it's like we need to just keep stay stay in the line of we need to get these people these abusers out and exposed and if and you know, help your other sisters help your um if you have a, pl a social media platform which thankfully we all do that's that's a very public platform you know you need to be retweeting the 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 links and the hotlines and things that, that can help because all we're trying to do at this point is show solidarity and to help others in, in any way that we can 
Mm-hmm. One of the best things that might be coming out of the quarantine is everybody's focused on the same spot right now. Everybody's online. Everybody's at home with a lot of people, a lot of time on their hands. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of giving that extra boost to this movement that might not have existed had this been a thing six months ago. Right. Well, because not only are people sitting, like you said, online, but I think the reason why a lot of this stuff is coming up, you know, it's, it's been a, it's a pretty tumultuous environment right now Mm -hmm. within all this. Like we have, you know, the black lives matter movement and now the speaking out movement and then the coronavirus on top of it, like people are scared. People are scared and they, you know, but when you sit home, when you're, when you stuck, when you're stuck at home, you get, if you're like me, you get stuck, you get, in your thoughts and you start thinking mm-hmm. about that. And so I think that that has like in tune, you know, ignited a lot of people going like, you know what, this has really bothered me for a very, very long time. Yeah. And as they have the time to sit with it and sit with their feelings and sit with their thoughts about it, they're like, this is bullshit. I'm yeah. not gonna, you know what I mean? I don't need to sit here because who's to say how the wrestling business, the landscape, especially on like an independent level, which where a lot of these stories are coming from is going to look like coming out of here. Like I, I don't know if we're going to see like live wrestling shows, like on a sense of like touring wrestling for another year. Like, I really don't know. I don't know how that's going to look. So change, yeah. is it affecting their business in that sense. Like when you think about like a lot of times when you say a lot of these girls like, oh, I don't, I may not get booked or I may not do this or it's going to affect my reputation. They don't have to worry about that because who's to say what this is going to look like anyway. So why not? Like that's a perfect time to go like, you know, yeah. hell to the knob. Hell to the now. And everything's been virtual now. I just did a Wizard World virtual Comic Con. So me talking earlier about going to Comic Cons, yes, I enjoy going, but to have uh, a job where it's like, you know, you're I go to events that are huge and you know, do you do a QA and there's like thousands of people out there, that probably can't happen anymore, at least not anytime soon. So that's why it is best to be home and educate yourself and, and learn new skills and to do things that can, you know, help you in other areas because I think a lot of what we're used to is gonna change. Traveling, everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, with what you just said there, Val, what is the one thing for both of you, we'll start with Val, that you miss most about the world that existed before March of this year? Oh, travel. Definitely travel. Um, You know, we had this conversation again on God TV about vacations because someone said, oh, what's your favorite vacation? And we all kind of went, especially Mickey, because she was saying, you know, in WWE, you don't really get a lot of vacations. You go somewhere and you might see a little bit more of it, but the the more and more... uh, excuse me, the more I grew up, the more I started to realize that I loved traveling, not just, it doesn't really count to travel and go to see one city and do a show there and see the airport and leave. Like I wanted to go, always wanted to go see Europe. So now I'm moving to the UK. I've been able to go to all sorts of places and mostly just for fun, or even if it's a show and I stay another three or four days, I make sure that I really go and see some beautiful places. So I would say traveling is number one for me. Traveling for leisure really would be number one. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same for you, Mickey? Um, I miss traveling, but traveling like in real time, like traveling without that fear. I went to the, I had to travel the other day and obviously, you know, I'm got my hand sanitizer. I got my mask on. I'm like, but then you see different, but all the stores are closed. All the restaurants are closed. The only thing that you can go is to like that little Hudson news thing and get like maybe a to go sandwich. The airport, the airlines are not serving any food like or and even like east to west coast flight. I think I had to take an east to west coast flight for Shad's funeral. And they literally gave me like a little brown baggie, like a packed lunch with like a baby water bottle in it and some nuts and cheese its And that's what I got for my for the whole flight. flight over. So thankfully I'm smart. So I'd eaten, but it's like that, like real, like. I enjoy like that first class treatment. I enjoy going to the airport and perusing the shops and I don't care if it's overpriced, you know, I I find a really sweet pair of sunglasses that are on sale, but that are not on sale. You know what I mean? I want to be able to go to the restaurant and belly up to the bar and have a cocktail and order something before I get on my flight and and none of that real travel. And like, even hotels, like right now, like this, I had to check into a hotel and they go, well, we, we're not, we don't service your room the whole oh, time you're there. No. So if you need anything, just come down, let us know, call us up, come down to the front desk. We'll have it waiting on you. So if I needed towels or coffee or anything like that, and as far as trash, I just had just left it outside the little baggies, you know, the laundry bag wow. and put, leave it outside the room. And I'm like, this was a four day stay. So I'm like yeah. literally quarantined myself in my room, the, the fitness center and everything's not open. And it's just like that whole thing of like being able to live your a life yeah. while being on the road. Yeah. Stuff yeah. we took for granted. Like, 
it sounds really pretentious, but like I love when my girlfriends now go away and I want to go to the champagne bar and we sit there and we start to dream about all the things we're going to do when we're there and grab a magazine stuff that's so frivolous and silly, but it's like, that's what I, that's what made me happy was traveling to little, I took myself to Madrid like um, last summer just for four days because my husband was working a lot. I'm like, I'm just going to go. I stayed at a gay hotel, the rooftop hotel, very LGBTQ friendly, rainbow flags. I had a ball. I'm so jealous. When you, when you guys do signings or you're interacting with a lot of fans, I'm very curious to know what the one question that always comes up no matter where you are. And Mickey, what is it for you? Do you remember me from that one time when I met you um, six years ago at the signing that you did with Maria Canellis, let's say, for example? No, that's not. The answer know. is yes. Of course I remember you. Oh, hey, yeah, good, to good, to see see you. You. good to see you. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> That I do get you do get asked that question a lot of like do you the do you remember and then you feel like such a heel because you probably don't remember I mean there's friends that there's like stories that my friends tell me they're like oh do you remember that time when we all did this that and the third and I'm like not really and they'll have to go more into detail and I'm like oh yeah I do remember that so yeah um favorite feud of all time favorite match of all time those those are very you know Typical. Those are the in, in the four seconds that you have as you sign the autograph, take a picture, and they walk away. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. So, it's so hard because you get rushed through. We always say like we remember those signings, and they the boys hated us in those like when we'd have to do those long VIP signings where it was all of us sitting at a table because we're yappers and mm -hmm. fans obviously want to have that conversation with you, and they like are totally they're trying to they'll go into like and you're like mm -hmm, and you know that they're like there's a huge queue behind them and that the, the security is like, okay, y'all, you know, yeah. we're just, yeah. You know, you know, I, I tend to get, not all the time, at least, at least once a day per comic con or whatever. Um, and now thankfully I'm kind of, not thankfully, but I don't usually sign as much as I'm out actually working, which I find a lot more like stimulating and fun. I feel like I'm actually doing something. There's people like, so you have all your photos in front of you, right? At least once a day, if not more than once, somebody will go, is this, is this you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. I'm I have red hair. Who is? <laughs> Who to answer it? And then, uh, oh, okay. Good. You know they don't know wrestling, but it doesn't matter. Like I would never go up to someone's table and go, "Oh, is this you? Who's this? Who's this?" Wow. All the time. Have you guys ever been mistaken for someone else, or who is the celebrity that you do get mistaken for? Oh gosh. <laughs> In wrestling, I would say that I have had, I and I've gotten super hot at it. Like, I think it's pretty much any female with brown hair. Nikki Bella and Maria Kanellis were the were the two go tos of like Maria, and I'm like, I'm not Maria. No, yeah. Maria. Okay. <laughs> no offense, Maria. I love you, but I'm not you. Just like it was, that's so annoying, Melina. Every yeah, everyone with the same color hair. And sometimes I think people think if you're not in a wrestling setting, they just know that you're from wrestling and you must be so and so. Um, I've gotten like you know Maria before redhead. I've gotten Dixie many times, which I always thought was hysterical. Well, she didn't have her hair. To each their own. Classic <laughs> thing. Look them up. But um, I'm laughing because I was at a signing, and um, I'm just gonna start the story like this. Make it real interesting. I have no judgment if you like pornography. That's cool. I fit, find, think it's perfectly healthy. Don't mind. Uh -oh. Don't hate it myself. Anywho, we're not taping this, right? <laughs> I was a girl. I was sitting next to uh, Gianna Michaels, who I didn't know I was on the signing with only girls from the adult film industry. And while I think that's fine that they do signings, and they were actually very nice girls, I was a little annoyed because I just thought people are going to think that this is what I do. And it's just not correct. And I just, it would make it awkward. And so it did because it was a, a two girls, I believe they're both blonde. And then the one girl who was supposed to be there couldn't make it. Not only was she a redhead, she lived in England. And we looked so similar that I couldn't even be mad at people. Cause I was like, if I was sitting here, I'm sitting right next to where she should have been. And on the flyer, we looked like the same person. Wow. Her name was I so- would have just played the role. You could have signed her name up and you could have gotten double, you know. Yeah. Well, sorry, what was her name? Sophie something. I don't know what the last name is. I'm, she, I'm sure she Everyone in the comments will be oh. telling you exactly no. what her name was. Yeah, sure. no, no, but, this but, movie, no, sir, that was not me. And how would you recognize me in this position? Because that sounds like a very adult film, sir. <laughs> yeah. Mickey, I had Nick on the show uh, earlier this year, and he told the story of how you guys met. 
<laughs> and I, I just want to, I just want to like run this by you to make sure that this is, you know, completely accurate to your recollection. He said that he was walking, it was like, he was walking to like a pre-tape area where, or a, a photo shoot area wearing just his trunks. And he thought he, you thought that he was out of earshot and you went, I'm a looking and I'm a lacking. <laughs> that sounds like you. Come on. That did happen. But, but what he's <laughs> failing to mention is there's there was other in, interactions. Like he was actually, he didn't like me, I don't think, as a person when I first met him because he said that I blew him off. But I don't know if you've met Mr. Aldous before. But he... he thinks he like he would like the way he would walk around. Like I remember seeing him walk backstage with like Doug Williams or something. When I first saw him, this is where he was in his, I think he had like a sweater on or something like something very like a cardigan or something. Right. And I'm like, so I recognize that he was handsome. I'm like, mm. Right. But, and then I'm, I'm going to see him. He's like walking by. With his, right. Hey, Peacock, so, you know, hey, the wrestlers, they Peacock, they kind of, you know, he's Peacock. You. Right. So I'm like, he didn't large. say hi to me. So I was in the middle of like, I think I was talking to somebody and walking, but I'm like, oh, he didn't say hi to me. I ain't saying hi to him. Like, he looks like he's kind of cocky, right? That was my initial thing. Fast forward, I'm doing something with, uh, I don't even know if this was the same week, but that was my first encounter with Nick. And then the next time I saw him, I'm in the ring with Al Snow and Lisa Marie. And we have like our angle, we have stuff that we're doing and the stuff. And then here he comes. Now he's all because he's going to a photo shoot, <laughs> right? He's going to a photo shoot. He's got, he's all tanned up. He's oiled up, you know, he's peacocking. He's got his chest out as far as it can go, you know, big chest. And he comes out on the, it's not like he walks the side ramp, you know, he, he knew, he knew what he was doing. It's not like he walked the backstage to scoot around. He comes out like the, the grand entrance, like on stage to walk down said ramp, like he's really doing it. And so of course, how am I going to ignore him? He's like lit up, the lights are thing, the oil is glistening. I'm like, <laughs> it's all, it's oil. and I look at Lisa and Al, I'm like, and I did hit the, I'm a looking and I'm a liking. I did not think, I forget that we were the only people in the arena really at that time, except for whoever was so I did hit that and I did recognize and I look over to Al and then Al, his, him and Al's interaction was pretty good because Al realized that Nick heard it as well. But me, Lisa and myself, I didn't even really realize that he heard it because we just started cackling like, <laughs> and we went back to work in our match or whatever. And yeah, I love that's it. A story, but. I find it funny that uh, my first interaction or first time seeing you guys, uh, I swear, I, I think I told you the story. I know I told Nick this story that you were doing a photo shoot, flip that around. You were doing a photo shoot on the ramp and he was like, what? he might as well have had binoculars. He was watching and just, huh. And I was like, you're such a mark. I said something like, what are you doing? He was like, I just, he said something like, that he, something really like serious, like, wow, or she's just everything or something. And I was like, okay, like you're being really obvious, but isn't that funny that it was the same thing. You were doing a photo shoot and he was looking at you like with the, you know, the little emoji with the heart eyes. Oh. Oh, yeah. bubble head and yeah. he's told me a story similar where doug told him to pick his tongue off the ground or something the same day yeah. <laughs> That's That's funny. Funny. yeah so maybe he's twisted this where that happened like which one happened first the chicken or the mm. egg i don't really know and mm. his mind that and i'll even tell you this that we were going to i was going to go eat we were going to go eat um one time and then he and robbie e were at a dinner and I, I did stick my finger in his cheesecake, and then I went over to go eat by myself. I'm like, oh, you're gonna eat that? But we yeah. do the weirdest things when we flirt. Like, if you think back to like weird things or like you know bold things, and you're like, who was I? Like, this is pre-marriage me. It's weird. Well, you turn into a twelve-year-old. Yeah, know. like I stuck my finger in his cheesecake. Well, Val, how did you meet your husband? Uh, <laughs> Whenever you ask him how he met me, he says he lost a bet, which was my original joke. Uh, that's why I laughed. I like, just hear him going, lost a bet, huh? No, um, we actually, when I met him, I was um, over here for Comic-Con, and it was in Milton Keynes, and they said, uh, you're going to go to Milton Keynes, you're going to go to Cardiff, 
Um, and Milton Keynes, there's nothing to do. You're not going to like it. But Cardiff is great. I ended up having a great time in Milton Keynes. And Cardiff, um, for that trip for me, it was not that great. Yeah, weird. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. He was, was the ref. And he he, he was the, the booker as well. He's a ref, but he also is an agent for the wrestlers and things like that. He brought us to um, Alan's restaurant that he owned at the time. It's this big, fancy gastro pub. And they all wanted to go out to this big meal. And I'm thinking, like, there's a subway by my room. Like, I'd rather just, like, do I have to go do this? But I was the only one that didn't want to do it. I'm glad I did. Because we, we drive all the way out. To the countryside it's this beautiful pub very overpriced <laughs> i remember i had an onion tart and i had to chip in like 40 pounds and i'm like okay that's weird so the whole night i'm kind of like blah but he was there i don't think i knew initially he was one of the owners but he was talking to us and just being real I just i saw how he treated people all night it was just lovely um he came, out, he came to hang out with us the next night because he knew linsky um he knew MVP, who had previously been in the restaurant as well, because Linsky always took the wrestlers to this restaurant. And yeah, we started hanging out. I, I then visited England uh, a few months later because my sister lives in London, still does. And we just started a little courtship. And then months after, we had a kiss. I had to force myself on him. It's a long story. He was <laughs> him. Uh, five, months went, five months went by. We talked on Skype and the phone every day for like five months, had our first official date. And I said to my mom, either this is the rest of my life or I've really misconstrued this. And from that first date, done. I would have moved anywhere for him at all. Yeah. And now you live across the pond. I do. It's like We're winter. To get them back. I'm like, I'm trying to fish them back. I know. I think, obviously, I'd like to go home as soon as lockdown's over. We've always kind of talked about maybe doing a little more traveling over there and maybe getting like a house or something in Orlando one day. So we'll see. I love how you keep calling it lockdown because I keep thinking of the TNA pay-per-view. <laughs> yeah, that's real different. <laughs> real different. <laughs> That's a very, that, that one actually might be more enjoyable. <laughs> oh, the oh, no. page. So where can everybody find God TV? Oh, well, you go ahead, Mickey. Um, well, there's GodTV.com where you can find everything. But we are on Instagram. We are on Facebook. The main thing we try to drive everyone to is our YouTube page. Obviously, we have all of our social media channels. We have Twitter, Instagram. Um, we just launched our Patreon. Everything yeah. is God TV is at God TV or at the God TV. And obviously like there's, but it's the same icon. We try to make it really, really simple. Mm -hmm. Um, and even in our bios, we have the links to our YouTube. So if you are more of a Twitter user, you can go to the link in the YouTube and it'll take you to the YouTube page to go ahead and like it and subscribe as well as on Instagram. And so, yeah, it's been well, nice. I'll put it down in the description because we are on YouTube Yay. as we speak right now. So I know, I'm so excited. Yeah, so that hopefully some people that are watching right now can join you guys on there as well. Yes, please. Go ahead, I was gonna say, you know, you were one of the first people that I saw doing a show like this. And you've been so successful, you're just doing so great. Like, I mean, your show's so good. I had so much fun the last time I was on the show. So it was, oh, well, thank you. It was for you, I was excited about it. Oh, well, thank you. That's very kind. And like that was a year and a half ago. And oh, this yeah. has changed so much. I mean, YouTube's my, my main thing now. And that just goes to show that there is so much possibility out there with it. For sure. There is, yeah. And we hope that people will watch our show and, and want to get more social media savvy. You know, a lot of everyone has heard of all the different platforms we're on and our Patreon and things like that. But we try to make the show as fan interactive as possible. You'll see pretty much every episode we have like a video submitted fan question. We've got a Twitter submitted fan question. We've got fan art that we feature. We are in the live chat room every single week on YouTube, every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Uh, so we now have like a little, we call them Team God, this army of people that are just so loyal and so loving and they're with us every single week and they're on our patreon we can chat with them there so blah. we have so much fun with it 5 p.m in which time zone eastern okay okay yeah it's late for you yeah i can't thank you guys enough this was so fun yeah thank you thank you and thank you for all coming together and making this happen and I'm glad you guys are, you know, doing well and you're healthy. And, uh, you know, I, I wish you continued success uh, with God, with everything else you guys have going on. Thank you so much. Likewise, this was fun. This was so fun. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Well, that was fun. Aren't they awesome? Please give God TV a subscribe. As I mentioned, the link is down below. And while you're giving out subscriptions, if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, the subscribe button's right down there as well, so please give us a subscribe. So excited to see Mickey James back in the ring. Hopefully it's soon. Sounds like she's healed up and ready to go, although I, I still can't believe that she performed on stage, was on tour with a torn ACL. That's crazy. She is tough, spelled T-U-triple-F, tough. Crazy.
crazy. <laughs>